I am going to talk about making online learning work, definitely. But before we get into that, let's talk about what happened over the last half a year. So universities went fully online, sent their students packing, empty their campuses, and continued delivering their lectures virtually. Students were sat at home. They were looking at the same faces they had been looking at so far. Uh, they would do their work, they would do their readings, they would submit their homework. So far, so good. Schools. Schools is a bit of a touchy subject. Uh, all schools closed. Some of them dutifully resumed their four hours a day instruction virtually this time. Others would just send some materials to parents and let, leave them to fend for themselves. Uh, many schools were somewhere in between. Uh, from what I've heard, this has been a horrible experience for students, uh, for parents, there, were, there are no fans. Now, in the corporate world, facilitators thought that, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put my slide deck uh, online and call it e-learning, and if I have a one-day team retreat somewhere, I'm just gonna film it all, put all eight hours of video online, and here you go. So, uh, we had what you might call an online learning utopia of sorts. Everything was online, everything was open, and a lot of the things were free because there, there were very many content uh, providers that opened up their platforms and made, made them accessible to everyone. Yet, where, where is the breakthrough of online education? Where is this promise that we've been talking about for the last 10 years? Three things became very clear. First of all, that the digital learning capability is essential. Organizations and institutions that had that capability already, they were, they were able to adapt that much easily and smoothly. Second of all, upskilling is needed fast and at scale. Many people have lost their jobs. There are some people, a considerable number of people who have lost their entire careers. People are looking at long-term unemployment, which, is, which makes it that much harder to come back and integrate yourself back into the job market. And at the same time, organizations, corporates, they are digitizing, they are optimizing, they are automating, and rightfully so, but at the same time, that means that that digital skills gap is growing ever wider. And finally, the third thing, Let's be honest here, something just doesn't feel right. You sit at university and then you sit at home and although you're seeing the same face and you're getting the same content, something just doesn't feel right. Looking at that face for hours on end on your computer screen is just, something's off. It's a bad experience as an experience and it's definitely not good learning. So why is that? Let me unpack. So first of all, there are a few factors that are unrelated to the actual learning, but they are equally important. First of all, the online learning that we have seen so far is, was always supposed to be a temporary solution. It got stitched together in two weeks tops and deployed everywhere, at schools, universities, companies, everywhere. It was never supposed to be that, that solution, that, that, that digital learning that we are talking about. And I think it's unfair to judge what we have been experiencing so far as the promise or nightmare, depending on your experience with it, of, of digital learning. Second of all, lack of headspace. Very many people over this pandemic, they just had no headspace whatsoever to learn. They were worried about their health, they were worried about their families, about their livelihoods, and when people are stressed out, they cannot learn properly. There is just no headspace. Third, lack of access. This pandemic has laid bare the inherent inequalities in our societies. It means that it turns out that just going digital isn't as easy when there is a considerable number of people who don't have access to devices, who don't have access to the internet, or even a quiet room to study in. And then there's, of course, a social function. It turned out that schools and universities, and especially schools, they serve a social function that is beyond their core educational function for students. This is support, the sense of community, and so on. And then, of course, 
there's the biggest one of all. The fact that content doesn't equal learning. I cannot stress this enough. People don't learn purely by consuming content. There is a reason why sometimes you pick up a book, you start reading it, and by the end of it, you can barely remember what was at the beginning. There is a reason why you sometimes go to a conference, you take notes, and a few days later, you look at your notes and it's as if you're looking at them for the first time. It's the same reason why you can binge on a 10 hour video course and, or online course in any format and then forget it shortly after. And most painfully, this is also the reason why so many people spend in Lithuania four years in higher education and then struggle to remember much of what they learned there or much of what they heard there, if not learned. So there is a lot of content out there. And if content was the answer, if it was about content, if learning was about content, learning and upskilling would be, would be ubiquitous. It wouldn't be a problem. We would have this all solved. So how do people learn? Uh, educational neuroscience is a relatively new field, but so we don't know all of it. The brain is also quite a, quite a complicated organ, so there's still a lot to learn, but we know a few things. We know that affect, or in other words, emotion, plays a part, meaning that if you're feeling something like interest, curiosity, surprise, disgust, anger, that lays the soil for learning, so to say. Another one is effort. And this is very important to understand that learning is necessarily effortful. Learning is a difficult and laborious process because to learn, you need to learn to think deeply about things. You need to take a step back. You need to even let some forgetting to set in, and then you need to come back and revisit that concept or topic again. It's called retrieval practice. And the more, the harder it is, the more difficult you find it, the more robust, the more quality the learning is. And this is the, exactly the reason why cramming doesn't work. Because if you, if you read and reread and reread uh, everything before, uh, the, the, the last night before an exam, this is a technique used by many students, you may feel that you're learning a lot, that you're remembering a lot, but you actually forget it shortly after. This is also the reason why if you binge on 10 hours of content anywhere, you forget it shortly after. And this is also the reason why lecturing as it is doesn't work. Because if you think about it, it's about a person standing in front of a classroom and just broadcasting information for a few hours. Finally, prior knowledge. We, we learn by tying new things to our existing web of knowledge of sorts, proverbially speaking. Every new piece of information needs to be connected to something that we already know, we have experienced from any part of our lives. This means that to learn better, we need to learn from different perspectives. We need to learn from different points of view. And this is where interdisciplinary learning comes in. It also means that learning has to be relevant and contextual. In practice, this means that the teacher, whoever they are, school teacher, professor, facilitator at a, in, in a corporate learning setting, or even if there is no real teacher per se, if it's just a self-guided experience, that invisible teacher, they need to make sure that any new piece of, 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 of information it's somehow situated in my context. Otherwise, otherwise, there is just no way for me to keep hold of that information. So in fact, I'm gonna challenge you. In a few days, think back to this presentation and I guarantee that the things that you remember, the only things that you remember from what I'm talking about now are the things that are either personally relevant to you, to your experience, to your existing knowledge, to your interests, things that uh, have sparked genuine curiosity or things that made you feel something, even if it's, uh, even if you vehemently disagree with me or even if you feel offended, these are real emotions, they're gonna help you remember, I'll take them. So to summarize, we have 
affect, we have effort, we have prior knowledge. And now this is not a complete list, not nearly. There are many ways to slice and dice these concepts. There are many more of them. There are also other concepts that come in when we talk about motivation and engagement, and even more when we take all of that into a digital environment. Uh, and there are also some differences between how children and adult, adults learn. But universally speaking, to learn, at first, we need to get interested. We need to feel something, something needs to be sparked. Then we need to take this new piece of information and think about it and ruminate on it. And we need to explore it from, from different perspectives. Then we need to take a step back, then maybe revisit it in a different context maybe discuss with other people because they're gonna tell you how they are perceiving the same context. So you get their point of view. That's some, that, that, that's some variation, that's some varied learning. And then you need to do something with it. You need to practice, you need to get feedback, and then you need to adjust in your head the understanding, your understanding of that context, of, the, of that concept. So you practice it over and over again. And even as I'm saying that, even, even if I, when I'm thinking about it, it's, it's just tiring. And that's because learning isn't necessarily an effortful and active process. And if what I'm talking about right now feels unfamiliar, it's because it's done the opposite way at schools at universities, many of them right now. This concept of having a teacher, a professor, for example, like in, in this specific case, a teacher standing in front of a classroom and broadcasting knowledge is a relic from the 19th century, post-industrialization, when there were a lot of people of factory workers, a lot of children of factory workers who needed some baseline education so that they could become factory workers themselves. So what do you think are the origins of the school bell. That's a relic from, uh, from, from factories. And yet, 200 years later, we are still doing the same thing. Despite having insight into educational neuroscience, into how people learn, despite knowing that 19th century skills and 19th century education model is not gonna teach the 21st century skills, despite knowing that the children that are starting, that are, are entering education right now, that we are making it that much harder for them to adapt to the world that they're gonna find 12 years later once they graduate. Where I'm getting at is, bad online learning scales this fundamentally flawed model. Bad online learning scales the flawed model. It means recording lectures, putting them online, and calling it learning. It's even worse if you're doing it digitally, because then you're losing uh, the peers around you, you're losing the space that's dedicated for learning, aka the classroom, uh, and you're just there sitting in your living room with a laptop in your lap. And of course, you need mighty self-regulation skills to not get distracted by life, essentially. At the same time, Good online learning can help facilitate this real, true learning that I'm talking about. It can help spark interest. It can help personalize content for each learner. It can facilitate that exploration. It can facilitate discussion and all of these good social aspects of learning. It can help support the learners who are struggling and it can help stimulate those who are breezing through. It can help the students who do not have that support at home and at least to a degree equalize the, the playing field. So just a few examples of that, what I'm talking about, uh, just so you know what's out there and the breadth of education technologies and, and digital learning that can be applied. Uh, these are not endorsements. These are just good examples that I've come across. So for example, Minerva, as they call it, the intentional university. It's a highly selective, fully online, interdisciplinary university designed from first principles, meaning that it's designed from the principles that I outlined earlier and built into this, experience, this learning experience 
that's the, with the foundation of actual learning sci science behind it. Uh, then there is Jill Watson, an AI uh, artificial intelligence driven assistant at Georgia Tech. It was an experimental one, but it's, uh, the results were pretty cool because students could not tell that their teaching assistant was a robot. It was so good. Obviously, there is a lot for, uh, for, for uh, AI to go before they can pass the Turing test, but this technology is already there to take at least some of the admin burden and, and to help students at the point of need. Another one, a brilliant org. This is an app. This is actually a pretty brilliant app um, to teach quantitative skills in a, in a highly visual way. Uh, uh, as you can see the, the example in a GIF. Um, there are also similar apps for physics, for, for chemistry and other experiential subjects. Uh, then uh, there's also PhotoMath, which is uh, another pretty neat app to teach maths. And uh, again, I'm not, I don't mean to talk about these specific apps, but about the possibilities of what can be achieved. If I am solving a maths problem uh, in my notebook, and then I take a picture of it, it recognizes the problem and gives me the step-by-step -step instructions. Imagine what it can do to students who cannot get that, that help at home or who just start hating maths because they get stuck and they get no support because uh, the teacher has to support 30 kids. Uh, BrightBytes. BrightBytes is an analytics platform that among many, many other things can help identify and intervene early if a student is struggling. Class Dojo, it's a classroom, um, classroom community between students, uh, teachers, and parents, involving parents into, into that entire process. So these are just a few examples. Where do we go from here? So the pandemic happened, and we were thrust into the digital world, into the digital learning world. And I think at the same time, we have been presented with a once in a generation opportunity to stop, to reflect, and to rethink education from the ground up, to make it enjoyable as education should be, to make it truly enriching, and to make it accessible to all. So should we take it? Or should we wait another 10 years and see what happens? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Agli. It's in, uh, I was just thinking that, yes, Harvard, you, uh, Harvard education gives you that uh, public speaking skill too, right? <laughs> That was incredible, and I'm uh, introducing Angelika um, Rustikiena, uh, a head of uh, junior achievement in Lithuania, who is going to lead the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Hello, Agle. It's nice to see you back here in Lithuania. In Lithuania, actually. Uh, so thank you very much uh, a lot for your questions and your thoughts and your interest. And you know, there is still a saying from even the role models in our society about uh, the thing that nothing and no one will change their relationship and connection between student and a teacher. What is your point of view about this uh, question and the saying? Yeah, so uh, broadly speaking, I, I of course agree. Uh, but I'll also add that uh, learning technologies, online learning, digital education, ed tech, however broad you think about it, they're not meant to replace teachers, uh, either teachers, teacher, teachers, as I said, uh, uh, at any stage uh, of, the, of the formal education journey. They are meant to supplement them. They're meant to make them more effective they are meant to help teachers maybe make even their own work more enjoyable and focus on developing kids uh, so as you said this can, technology can help teachers become more effective it can help spark spark interest it can help support some students it can help direct their attention it can um make learning more personalized, give more practice opportunities, bring things to life. So all of those things. But at the same time, having said that, I would also challenge the notion that just because there is somebody in standing in front of a classroom, that it makes the experience automatically 
better. This is a broken model that is not conducive to learning. And finally, I will also add that not every student has a teacher like that. Not every student has a teacher who they have that sort of connection with. So we also need to think about them. Thank you so much, Agla, for your questions. And I just remind to our all listeners that you have an opportunity to ask questions on a slide. And I still have one more question for you in a discussion. We have in our Lithuanian system now the review of a general curriculum. And while talking about distant learning, online learning, and the opportunities of a teacher connection still with a student, what do you think should be systematically reviewed? Uh, what should we put in place for sure tools systems methods uh, um, anything what you should think is a must while reviewing and challenging our education and upcoming programs to become more up to date and uh, reach those self-directed learning in a way and a learning where we see that the students are learning themselves and teacher becomes more a mentor Oh yeah, uh, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> at first, of course, if we're talking about online learning, digital learning of any, of any kind, uh, any technology, we need to ensure that everybody has equal access, meaning that everybody has access to a device and everybody has access to the internet. It can be at home or it can be accessible somewhere, but every student needs to have access. And once we have that in place, I would say that my suggestion is two pronged, maybe. So obviously there is a lot to be done using digital technologies, but they cannot be the focus of it. Just, just implementing them isn't gonna transform the system. It's about reviewing the way this education process works holistically. Because if you think about it, Lithuania is a, is a small country we have like, human capital is our, our only, uh, well, I wouldn't say export, but it's, it's our competitive advantage locally, nationally, globally. Uh, we cannot possibly afford to keep optimizing the education system to, te to pass tests. Bigger countries can do that. We cannot. We need people who are creative, who are adaptable, who are critical thinkers, who are fantastic collaborators, who are communicators, and at, at the end of the day, who are just happy, healthy, well-rounded people. And we're not going to achieve that if, what we're, if we are optimizing the entire system for them to pass tests. And uh, of course, it's easier said than done, but there are a few things that I feel especially strongly about. So one of them, as I said, moving from the teacher as somebody who's standing like this know-it-all who broadcasts information to students to a facilitator. This is something that uh, Lina also said before me. Um, the facilitator of discussion, a facilitator of projects, uh, of, of, of uh, project-based learning, whatever it is. I actually uh, had a chance to work with uh, one innovative school here in the UK, and they didn't have a single classroom with desks laid out in rows. So that tells you that this model can be achieved, although this is not mainstream, unfortunately. Another thing, um, I guess, is that multidisciplinarity needs to be implemented for, for several reasons. First of all, obviously, the world is more complex. The world cannot be divided by subject. There is no reason why we are teaching literature and history separately or languages and any other subject. These are just a few examples. Another uh, thing is that innovation, which is so important, especially for a small country, innovation happens at the, uh, at, at the crossroads between different disciplines. And finally, even from the educational perspective, and even from the learning design perspective, that multidisciplinary learning, learning about several things at the same time from different perspectives, that's a superb learning method. And I'm, I know that having said that, we need teachers as facilitators, we need multidisciplinary learning, you think about it that, yeah, now learning, knowing how much, how much time relearning takes, obviously it's going to take longer to teach a single topic. And that means that we're going to be able to teach fewer things within those, say, 12 years at, uh, at school. But I think that's okay because we need to snap out of that illusion that content equals learning, of that illusion that 
the, the thicker the textbook, the more the person will learn. That the more content we're gonna throw at them, they're gonna download it and somehow become more educated. They're not, that's not how learning works. And thinking like this is actually borderline harmful for, for actual learning to happen. And finally, I think, well, not finally. Uh, one other thing is that I think mistakes should be, students should be free to fail because making mistakes, learning from these mistakes, getting feedback, this is one of the most powerful mechanisms of learning that we have. And what we're doing right now, we are punishing students for every single mistake. And they're not stupid. They're optimizing for that, meaning that they're, they're trying to make fewer mistakes, which means that they're taking fewer risks. They're exploring less. And that, again, goes in the way of actual learning. So uh, in practice, that means that not every project needs to be graded. Not every homework assignment, not ev everything needs to be graded. Obviously, we cannot get away from summative assessments because we are operating in a global context and uh, university admissions, and this is a, such, such a big global problem right now. But uh, normalizing failing, I think it's a huge one. And it's going to make, if we can solve that, it can, it can make a huge change. And once we have that, then we can wrap around digital learning because digital learning can support that very well. So as I said, if we have a platform, an analytics platform that can track who's falling behind, uh, then we can support those students. And again, collecting data not to punish them, but to support them. Another thing is using digital technology to present content beforehand so that students can come into the classroom and participate in a facilitated discussion, a discussion facilitated by their teacher. So this, this is the so-called flipped classroom model. Another way to do that is if we are doing project-based work, we can use technology to present that content at the point of need that students can access at whatever depth they desire to solve the project that they are, they are working on and they're feeling passionate about. And that, that makes them love learning. And of course, what I said, uh, technology that helps you practice things, technology, uh, that brings subjects to life. For example, right now I have, I have my phone, and if I drop the phone from this height or from that height, would the velocity differ? There are apps that can measure that. There are apps that can bring physics to life, chemistry to life. You can make all sorts of experiments, everything that you weren't allowed to do in class, and make things go boom. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, just just to reiterate, know that I'm not saying that. Really, and um, I think. Uh, having you as our global citizen uh, we really count on your suggestions uh, for our no local <laughs> we can definitely make in practice some of your good ones and i've got the last question from you um uh, Agle, there is a question on the slide though are you suggesting that we should use more non-formal education methods in formal education uh if I, pers if I understand the question the way I think that it should be understood, I would say that the differentiation is artificial. The differentiation that in formal education, we are having this not, uh, information broadcast versus in informal education, we have all, all of this uh, doing. The, this distinction is artificial. So yes, we should have the methods that work informal education because formal education is something that's accessible to pretty much everyone and it is our duty to make it as effective as we can and not count on informal education to fill in the gaps so much Agra.